Good afternoon and welcome to today's Consumers Credit Union Public Lecture, a focus on Parkinson's, Alzheimer's and Lewy body dementia. I'm Lynn Jarman Johnson, Chief Marketing Officer of Consumers Credit Union. And I'll be joined today by Dr. Jose Braz and Dr. Rita Guerrero, two scientists from Van Andel Institute and Steve Ozinga, the philanthropy director at VAI. Now, Dr. Braz and Dr. Guerrero will share with us today what scientists are discovering about Parkinson's, Alzheimer's and Lewy body dementia, diseases that affect nearly 7 million people in the US alone. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today for today's lecture, especially all of our members. For many, this may be your first encounter with Van Andel Institute, but I'm certain it won't be your last. Consumers Credit Union and Van Andel Institute have an extremely long partnership. We start with the Purple Community and we support because all of the proceeds, 100% of everything that is given through our members and through us, go directly to research. And now I'd like to turn it over to Steve to give you a little background on Van Andel Institute. Lynn, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And I also am a Consumers Credit Union member, so it's great to be in your company as well. And again, thanks for um, being here today. Um, Van Andel Institute was established by Jay and Betty Van Andel in 1996 in Grand Rapids and has grown to become a global leader in Parkinson's disease research. And we're committed to improving human health through research and educational initiatives. We support the work of over 400 scientists, educators, and staff representing over 40 countries from around the world who collaborate with partners such as Stand Up to Cancer and the Cure Parkinson's Trust to create breakthrough treatment strategies for cancer, for Parkinson's, and other diseases. We have a graduate school that offers a rigorous PhD program that develops leaders in molecular and cellular biology and our K through 12 education institute empowers teachers to create classrooms that encourage curiosity, creativity, and critical thinking. But I've gone on long enough with the uh, introduction of Van Andel Institute. I wanna turn it back over to Lynn to introduce today's speakers. So back to you, Lynn. We are so honored to have Dr. Jose Braz and Dr. Rita Guerrero. They're originally from Portugal. They visited Grand Rapids, they toured Van Andel Institute, and the rest is history. That's when they decided to join. Now they use cutting edge technologies to analyze robust data from around the globe. And Dr. Braz and Dr. Giro are working to understand why and how neurological diseases occur. And they transform the lives of others through all of the discoveries. Dr. Braz is the leading molecular genesis whose research focuses on how genetic variability impacts the onset and progression of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. He joined VAI in 2018 as an associate professor in the Center for Neurodegenerative Science and as a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Parkinson's Disease and Brain Communication, as well as an associate editor for Frontiers in Neurology, Neurogenetics. Dr. Guerrero is a leader in parsing the genetic variations that contribute to neurodegenerative diseases. Impressively, she was the very first recipient of the Alzheimer's Research UK Young Investigator of the Year Award in 2016. She joined VAI's Center for Neurodegenerative Science as an associate professor in 2018, and she serves on the editorial boards of not one, but listen to this, the American Journal of Neurodegenerative Disease, Science Matters, Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, and Journal of Parkinson's Disease. If you find yourself with questions today, here's some housekeeping tips. Make sure that you ask those questions right in our chat in the Q&A section. We will get to them at the end. We are also taping this session so that there's no worries you can share with your family and friends. Thank you again, members, for joining us today and for all of you who are interested in this very important topic. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brass and Dr. Guerrero. Thank you very much, Lynn, um, and a big thank you to Consumers Credit Union and to the great team that we have at Van Andel Institute that made this presentation possible. It is a great pleasure for both of us to, to be able to share a little bit of our work uh, with you all. So thank you for your interest and thank you for taking the time to, to be with us today. Um, I just want to warn you uh, that we just got a, a, a small puppy, so if you hear any weird noises, he has been listening to us talk about neurogenerative diseases for the past day and a half, so he may want to help and join us here, so if that's the case, you know what's going on. 
<laughs> okay, so in the next slides, I want to, to start by briefly introducing ourselves and talk about what we what we are, what we do. And uh, we did our, our formal education in Portugal and we moved to the National Institutes of Health just outside Washington DC in Bethesda to do our PhD work. We moved again back to Europe uh, for our, our postdoctoral training uh, at University College London in the UK, where we progressed in, in our careers. And when we left the UK, uh, we had just started positions as program leaders in the recently created Dementia Research Institute. And we were at a lecturer level. And we moved because we visit the, the Van Andel Institute and we realized the great quality of science that, that was being done here, how collaborative the, the environment uh, is here and how nice everyone is at the Institute and, and outside. So, so we decided to, to move at the end of 2018 and we have been here uh, since then. We were very lucky uh, that we were able to bring some people that work worked with us uh, in London. Um, so we started a, a small group and we have been hiring other people uh, and growing our group. Uh, and we are very, very lucky that we have such a fantastic group of, of scientists and truly, uh, next slide, and truly, truly motivated people uh, that are currently uh, working with us. So in the next slide, uh, you can see what we do uh, every day and uh, we, in general, this is how we see our work. We try to identify genetic regions and genes that will then lead to a better biological understanding of these diseases uh, that will lead us to identify targets that can be used to develop treatments and drugs that can cure, prevent, or delay the onset of these diseases. We focus mainly on the left part of, of this figure. Um, and we use collaborations to move our work forward until the development of successful treatments. Uh, one important aspect of our work is that we don't work directly with, with patients, but we always have the people living with these diseases and their families at the center of our research. And I think this is what has made the difference for us over the years. So more specifically, the types of studies that, that we do um, include different flavors, and we can see this in, in the next slide. Um, so we have this, these two types of studies, family-based studies and case control studies. Uh, on the left, you see how we represent families. Um, and, and you can see we, we have uh, circles that represent females and squares that represent uh, males. And what we try and to do here is to compare the DNA between family members that are affected by a disease um, that is being passed through generations in the family two family members that are healthy. And the goal is to pinpoint the one change in the DNA that is only present in patients uh, and not in healthy family members. And that is the cause of disease in, in, this, in these families. So in the right side, you can see case control studies. Uh, this is the same type of comparison, but in here we applied the analysis to a large group of unrelated patients and a large group of unrelated uh, healthy controls. And the goal here is not to identify a cause for a disease, but to identify risk variants that increase or decrease the risk for these diseases. And I will let Jose tell you a little bit more about what we do. So on the next slide, this just um, a little bit of um, an overview of how much science has really advanced in such a short period of time. When we started to do um, research ourselves, we were able to study a single gene in maybe you know half a dozen individuals. So this was like 15 years ago, so really not that long ago. And this has changed to today where we were able to assess all genes in many thousands of individuals. And this has, has really, dramatically transform the way in, in which we can do science. This, of course, has one implication, which is um, to get all of these thousands of patients uh, DNA, we have to collaborate with people. And so this slide just shows our um, ongoing collaborations that are active at the moment. Um, each one of these symbols represents a place, a state, a country where we have, um, in many cases, multiple collaborators working with us that allows us to get these uh, large numbers of, of individuals that we need to study um, the genetics of, 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 of these diseases. In the next couple of slides, I want to tell you a little bit about some important concepts. So the first one deals with changes in DNA. And it's common for people to think that changes in DNA are bad. I mean, they're 
changes in something that makes us um, who we are. But in fact, the vast ma majority of changes that occur in the in DNA are entirely benign and they do not lead to disease or anything else. In fact, they make each one of us who we are and in different to anyone else. And so that's one concept that's important. Not all changes in DNA are bad. However, there's a small number of those changes that you can see on the next slide that when they happen, they're actually um, deleterious. They cause disease. And these are just two of the most common forms of how a, a genetic change can lead to disease. They can be autosomal uh, dominant in, in, and in that case, a single faulty gene leads to a disease. Um, these are dominant forms of disease and their counterpart are recessive forms of disease in which you, will, you would need to inherit two faulty copies of a gene from both your parents uh, to get the disease. And this has implications in the uh, likelihood of um, offspring having disease, of your, of your children having disease, um, as you can see um, in, in the slide there. So these are two important concepts uh, that tie in to much of the work that we're going to talk about over the next few slides. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Rita for her to tell you a little bit more about Alzheimer's disease. So, okay, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to start uh, to talk about Alzheimer's disease with some quick facts uh, to bring to your attention the extraordinary heavy burden that Alzheimer's and dementia have in our society. Um, Alzheimer's is the sixth cause of death in the United States, and there were close to 6 million people living with this disease in 2018. And these numbers are expected to, to rise and significantly and reach um, 14 million by 2050. So one other aspect that, that it's also very important, but it's difficult to account and we typically don't think about it, is how many hours of care is given by family members and other caregivers. And also really the, the heavy financial burden in our society that, that is reaching $290 billion in 2019. Um, and again, expected to, to increase with time. So uh, I just want to make sure that I bring across to you that, that this is not a disease of one patient. This is a disease that affects families uh, and society as a whole. So there is no health system in the world, either private or public, that will be able to cope uh, with the predicted uh, numbers uh, for dementia and, and Alzheimer's disease around the world. Uh, so I think it's clear how important it is to, to find a cure or something that prevents the disease or even something that is able to delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease just for a few years, um, even this will have a big impact in, in the numbers that we are seeing here. So in the next slide, um, you can see that uh, when we think about Alzheimer's disease, the most uh, common symptom that we think about is the difficulty in remembering information that has been recently learned. And this is because the disease typically uh, begins in effect, uh, to affect areas that, that of the brain that are uh, involved in learning. Um, as Alzheimer's disease then uh, progresses through, through the brain, it leads to increase, increasingly severe symptoms. People start to uh, be more and more confused. They start being disoriented. They, they are confused about people, about places, time, and they start having mood and behavior changes. Um, and at the later stages, they start having difficulty in speaking and walking. So um, what we really have here is, is a relentless progressive disease. Um, and it's definitely not part of normal aging. And we have no cure at the moment for, for this disease. Um, when we look at the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease, and you can see the image on, on top there, um, and, and we, we compare this, these images with um, age match healthy uh, individuals, I think it's easy to see how less volume the, the brains of Alzheimer's disease people have. The, sh the shrinkage uh, is very noticeable. Uh, and what happens here is that uh, the neurons, the brain cells die and they leave these this empty spaces um, in, in, in the brains that we don't see in healthy brains. Um, we have around 100 billion um, of these cells, of these neurons, and each of these cells are like tiny factories. They receive supplies, um, they have construction going on within their walls, they get rid of trash, 
And all of this needs to be running smoothly so that everything works well. And when something is not right, when something goes wrong, um, then we have problems and we start having um, the start of, of disease. And for Alzheimer's disease, the most likely culprits that we think are behind this process um, are two different protein structures um, that accumulate in the brain tissue. And you can see those in the images below. Uh, we call these plaques and tangles. They are formed by fragments of protein called amyloid in the case of tangles, and that's what you have on the left. Um, and the other, um, the other structures are tangles and are made of twisted fibers of a protein called tau. And these structures are the typical features seen in Alzheimer's disease brains uh, when using a microscope. And they contribute to which a definite diagnosis of these diseases, uh, which is only possible uh, after death. And this happens because during life, there are different forms of dementia that have different, uh, the very si similar symptoms. And so it's not always straightforward to clinically um, to clinically separate and distinguish these different forms. So this usually brings, uh, uh, to, brings us to a common question, that is, what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? And then in the next slide, we can easily see that the answer is um, Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. Dementia is an umbrella term that includes a uh, hundred or more conditions. All of them has, have some kind of changes in memory. Um, in most, the most frequent of, this, of these diseases is Alzheimer's. Others include frontotemporal dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, vascular dementia, and many others. And we do work on many uh, of these other dementias, but because of time, I'm just going to focus on Alzheimer's disease. And Jose will later uh, mention dementia with Lewy bodies further ahead in, in this presentation. So in the next slide, um, what I wanted to, to show you is that when I have a question, I typically use Google and I just Google what I'm looking for. And if we do this for uh, Alzheimer's disease, this and we wait for the algorithm to give us the most uh, the most searched uh, options that people do across the world, this is what you get. And, and you see things like, does Alzheimer's have a cure? And no, it doesn't. Uh, but you also interestingly see that there are a lot of questions related to genetics. Um, and this, um, I think, really, really reveals that uh, people, families, patients are uh, clearly uh, want to know how genetics work uh, in Alzheimer's disease. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. And as you can see in the next slide, uh, we can divide Alzheimer's disease, uh, taking into account uh, the genetics, the genetic components uh, in these three forms. Uh, we use 65 years as a cutoff to, to divide uh, Alzheimer's disease between what we call late Alzheimer's disease and uh, late onset and early onset. Um, people that develop the disease before 65 years, we say they have early onset Alzheimer's and after uh, we say they have late onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is a complex form of disease, the most typical one, the late onset one, sporadic, um, and there are different factors involved here. But I want to start by talking about early onset Alzheimer's disease, um, the familial forms, the inherited forms that usually have a very early onset, uh, can go as early as 30 years of age, um, but these are the minority of cases, so around 1% of cases. So in the next slide, you can see um, how, why it is important to understand these early onset forms of disease, even if they are so, so rare. Uh, and here, what I'm showing you are the, two, the three genes uh, that we know are mutated in Alzheimer's disease, APP, persimilin 1, persimilin 2. And I've talked about APP before because it gives rise to the formation of those sticky elements that deposit in the brains of, of Alzheimer's patients and lead to, to the formation of amyloid plaques. Um, so mutations in these genes and personally in one and two are also involved in this, in this process. Mutations in these genes um, led us to, to understand and to, to create this amyloid cascade uh, hypothesis. And it is important to understand this because this give, gave us um, a blueprint that has guided research uh, in Alzheimer's disease for the past three decades. And this is a very simple way of putting it, but um, what we are saying here is that mutations in those three genes 
uh, lead to, to an abnormal processing of, of the protein APP that leads to the formation of those sticky fragments uh, in, in the brain outside the cells. And that leads to the formation of tangles, leads to neuronal death, and eventually leads to dementia. So this has been guiding us for, for a while, and we base most of our studies on, on this blueprint. The next story in the next slide that, that I want to talk about um, is it's a good example of how genetics and the study of these families can be important. And this is a story com coming from Colombia. And if you're a fan of the TV series Nar Narcos, you'll recognize this geographical area in Colombia as the headquarters of Pablo Escobar and, and his drug cartels. Uh, unfortunately, in addition to having to deal with drugs in, in the region, the Yarumal region, uh, people there also have to deal with a very high frequency of a familial form of Alzheimer's disease. And this actually is a very unusual setting. If you remember, I said that this is the most uncommon form of Alzheimer's disease. But here we have 25 extended families with around 5,000 family members. 1,000 of them carry the same mutation in Presnilin 1. And this is very, very unusual. What we usually have is maybe one or two families across the world with the same mutation. So this is really atypical. And this is really bad, really catastrophic for the families, because you can imagine having and which don't have the, the mutation and won't develop disease. So we can test drugs uh, in this setting, and that's what's happening here. Uh, this, this family is... The next slide uh, is the next story that I want to tell you about, and this comes from Iceland. Um, and it, it is really important to understand and to know which genes we are involved in the disease and which specific mutations are involved in Alzheimer's disease. And this is because we can target these mutations and these genes for drug development. And this is, is, is um, until this study what, that was published before, uh, we always thought that, that mutations in APP uh, were causing disease. Um, and in this case, uh, and also, again, because uh, the genetic setting in Iceland is so different and so homogeneous, uh, researchers were able to identify a variant in the same gene in APP, uh, this change from an alanine to a threonine at position 673 of the protein, um, that is actually protective against disease, against Alzheimer's disease. So this is a very rare variant in the Icelandic population, and it's even rarer in other populations. So um, what we can use this variant for is, is as a model that we, if we are able to mimic the, the effect of, of this variant uh, with the drug, we are in a very good place to have, uh, to have a treatment for, uh, for Alzheimer's disease. So I've been talking about this early, uh, early cases. Um, I, I, I'm now going to talk a little bit about the late onset forms of the disease and the uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about associations. Uh, oh, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to talk, and next slide. <laughs> I'm going to talk about risk factors and associations. So risk factors are elements that increase the likelihood of someone getting a disease. They can relate to something that someone does, like smoking, or they can relate to something that it's unchangeable, like aging or uh, genetics. And aging is actually the most significant risk factor for Alzheimer's. Um, this is a bit of a busy slide, but I wanted to show it to you because it clearly shows how the risk factors for Alzheimer's accumulate along a lifetime. And also because it has risk factors on one side and has protective factors on the other. And, and the results are actually the balance between both, of, both types of, of factors. So what we are most, most interested in are these genetic factors here uh, and APOE or apolipoprotein E gene is the most significant genetic risk factors 
uh, for Alzheimer's disease. We have three flavors of, of this gene that we call E2, E3, and E4. Um, and if we carry uh, the E2 flavor, we are protected for the disease. But if we carry, we carry the E4 flavor, we have an increased risk for a disease. Um, but carrying the C4 flavor does, does not mean uh, necessarily that we will develop a disease. Uh, and it doesn't mean we need the E4 flavor to develop the disease. So it, it's, it's a flavor that it's neither necessary nor sufficient by itself to cause Alzheimer's disease. So it's the definition of, of re, a, re, a risk factor. What we do here is to study associations. Again, not looking now for causes of disease. We are looking for events that occur more frequently than what would be expected by chance. And if you remember from Jose's slides, he mentioned that before we were able to study a couple of genes in, and a couple of variants in a small number of individuals, but technologies have changed considerably. And we are now able to study millions of variants across geno the genome uh, in thousands of individuals at the same time. And that's the type of results that I'm, I'm that when comparing between Alzheimer's and, and, and controls um, will look something like this. And here, what you have in the x-axis, next slide, is uh, all the chromosomes from chromosome 1 to chromosome 22 on the right. And uh, each individual dot that you see there uh, is a variant in the genome. In the y-axis, uh, we have the degree of association with the disease. So if we have a very high peak, uh, like the one you have there for APOE, this means that this gene is significantly associated with disease. And this graphic is called the Manhattan plot uh, and because it sometimes resembles the skyline of Manhattan. And if we think about the evolution over the years of New York, uh, New York City skyline uh, in 1920, in the next slide we can see this, uh, you, you will see something like this. Um, but as people move into the city, more tall buildings are constructed. And for example, in 1980, uh, the skyline will look like this. And um, in 2020, um, this is how, uh, how it looks like uh, with a significant increase in the number of skys skyscrapers. And this is exactly what happens with genome-wide association studies. Before we only had APOE, next slide, uh, but as we are able to add more samples uh, to our studies and to do another analysis, we start to identify other peaks that are also associated with disease. And today in the next slide, we can see uh, we, we were able to add almost half a million samples to these studies. And we were able to identify around 30 regions of the genome that are associated with the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Each one of these regions has a very small contribution to the risk of disease. So why is it important to, to identify these regions? And one of, of the reasons why we, we need to identify all of these regions uh, comes in the next slide. And that's because um, these, these genes point us to um, pathways, biological pathways. And these are a series of interactions among uh, molecules in a cell that lead to some kind of outcome. It can be turning on a gene or turning off a gene or making the cell move or something like that. Um, it, but when we represent a biological pathway, we, we show something like what you're seeing here, just a small part of a cell with a sequence of events um, and some outcome. However, in, real, in reality, things are much, much more complex. And we can see in the next slide what actually uh, pathways look like. Um, and so in the middle of all this complexity, we need to have an indication of which pathways are the most important for the disease. And so it is clearly something that we as a society have to continue to address until we have treatments that stop 
or at least delay uh, this, these diseases. On the next slide, um, the, just showing here some of the most common um, symptoms that we associate with Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's is a movement disorder. Um, tremor is one of the, usually one of the initial signs of Parkinson's disease. There is a slowed movement uh, that patients present. And Im importantly, very similar to Alzheimer's disease, there is no cure um, for Parkinson's disease. Again, uh, very similar um, to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's is also um, a, a disease where we see proteins accumulating in brain uh, tissue. Um, in, in, in Alzheimer's, we told you about amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. In Parkinson's disease, we have Lewy bodies uh, that are comprised of a protein called alpha synuclein. So these are important concepts um, to keep in mind for Parkinson's disease. In terms of the genetics, um, when we started uh, getting interested in neurogenitive diseases in 1998, we actually thought that genetics would not play a role in Parkinson's disease. And if you had a history of, of disease in your family, you could not have Parkinson's disease because that was a, 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 an exclusion criteria in, for diagnosis. And so things really changed since then. And in 1998, the first gene was found to cause Parkinson's disease. And in the next slide, you can see how things have developed over the years. In 2004, we had just a handful of genes we knew caused disease, where changes caused disease. Just four years later, we found this gene called GBA, which I'll mention in a couple of slides again, where changes didn't cause disease, but they increased the person's risk uh, substantially. And then next year, we found two genes where changes were common. I mean, many of us will carry these changes, they don't cause disease, but instead they give very small increases in risk for developing Parkinson's disease. And this was through the technology that Rita mentioned before um, that gives us Manhattan plots um, and the technology is called genome-wide association studies. And over, the, over this period since 2009, we found a number of, of other genes where these common changes um, increase or modulate risk by a small amount. And in the next slide, you can see where we are today. There's a, a large number of genes on the left-hand side of that graphic where mutations cause disease invariably. There's a couple of genes in the middle where changes have an intermediate effect and they have intermediate frequency in the population. And then on the right-hand side, we now know that there are over 90 genes where changes are common in the population and they are associated with a small effect in modulating risk for disease. So I, I told you about GBA, one of the genes in the middle there, and I'll tell you about this again, just as an example of how powerful these genetic approaches are. This gene, GBA, encodes a, a protein called glucose rosidase, as you can see in the next slide. And mutations in this, in this gene, GBA, they cause a, a form of lysosomal storage disorder called Gaucher disease. Gaucher disease is a, is a very nasty disease that, that occurs early in life. And by any measurement, it, it's an, an entirely unrelated disease to Parkinson's disease. But what we found was that they're actually, these two diseases are linked at this gene. And this gave us a, a new avenue of research for Parkinson's disease based on all of the information we already had from Gaucher disease. And today there are um, clinical trials going on that are solely based on the finding at GBA. So switching gears a little bit for, to, towards Lewy body dementia, just as we wrap up the presentation, Lewy body dementia is the second most common form of, of dementia after, after Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly common, and just as Alzheimer's disease has a very high impact, um, not only on society, but on families as well. Lewy body dementia, as, as you can see in the next slide, is an umbrella term, much like um, dementia itself is an umbrella term. Lewy body dementia is an umbrella term that covers two conditions, um, dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease dementia. They're very similar in terms of, of their symptoms. Um, where they differ is on the order of occurrence of these symptoms. Um, and so this means that the diagnosis is often difficult to make uh, between certainly between these diseases um, and, and, they, and they share a lot uh, between them. Over the years, we've studied quite a bit of dementia with Lewy bodies. And it's, I think it's fair to say that most people would not have heard of dementia with Lewy bodies, um, certainly before Robin Williams was, was diagnosed. This was, um, this was really helpful for us as scientists because it really um, 
allowed people to get a better understanding that this is a common form of, of disease. Um, because as you look on the right part of this slide, what we're showing is the number of publications, scientific publications for these three diseases, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and dementia glue bodies. And you can see that dementia glue bodies in blue there has had a lot less um, effort going into understanding that disease compared to the other, uh, the other two um, neurodegenerative diseases. And so we really needed uh, people to um, understand that this is a common form of disease and we really need to study it a lot more. So we've done that over the last um, three or four years. And a couple of years ago, we published the first large genetic study in dementia with Lewy bodies. And here, what we've shown is that genetic um, factors play an important role in dementia with Lewy bodies. Not only that, but we've also shown that although genetics is involved in, in dementia with Lewy bodies, and although dementia with Lewy bodies is similar in many ways to Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease, the next slide shows you that Actually, from a genetic perspective, these are separate diseases. Dementia with Lewy bodies is a separate disease entity uh, genetically when compared to Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. So just to wrap up a couple more slides on uh, one of them on our, our goals going forward. So when we came to Van Andel, um, one of the things we noticed was that there isn't um, an effort in West Michigan to study neurodegenerative diseases, certainly not uh, from a genetic perspective. And as I mentioned before, we need to study thousands of people living with these diseases to obtain um, confident results. And so one of the things that we're um, very excited about is this MIND biobank that we're um, implementing as we speak uh, based, on, uh, based at the Van Andel Institute. What we're trying to do is to bring people together to be able to collect samples of these individuals here in West Michigan so that we ourselves can study them, of course, but also we want to maximize um, the information that we can extract from each one of these samples uh, by including them in these large international consortia, which we're part of, that will really allow us to make the most of each one of these individual DNA samples. And so this is something we're very excited about and that we hope uh, we'll be able to uh, have implemented um, in the next few months. Uh, and we think it's, it's a very important thing uh, to have here in West Michigan. So lastly, as we find genes, each one of the genes that we find gives us a new therapeutic um, opportunity. Each one of them is a potential target, a potential drug target. And of course, the more genes we find on this final slide, the more <coughs> targets we have. And so the chances of hitting the bullseye increase exponentially with the genes that we find to be associated with disease. And so with that, I hope you, you, you found this talk to be um, helpful. And I'll bring it back to Steve to, to chair our Q&A session. Sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Bras. Thank you, Dr. Guerrero, for that um, insightful um, presentation about the research that you're doing. So. I'd like to open it up now to the Q&A session. Um, we've had a number of questions that have come in during the, the talk, so we really appreciate that. If you haven't already submitted a question, please submit via the chat function and we will make sure we get those answered. But um, the first question that come through, and I'll throw it to both Rita and Jose and you can figure out who will answer it. What do you consider right now to be the biggest gap in knowledge today in Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and Lewy body dementia research? What is that biggest gap that's out there right now? So I'll, I'd say that the, the largest gap is understanding how a genetic change has an impact on biology. We're very good at identifying the changes, but understanding what they do in, in an individual, that's where we're lacking at the moment. And uh, part of this is technology. As technology continues to develop, we'll be able to do um, new things and improved approaches. But right now, I would say that that's probably the largest gap that we have. Yeah, but this is this is a gap that it's very specific to our area. Uh, of course, there will be uh, other gaps in, in other specific areas. But I, I, I agree this, this is an important gap right now. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much. Um, one of the uh, members asked a question. Uh, the member is 78 years old, does not have any symptoms of Alzheimer's, and he's wondering, is it still possible to get Alzheimer's even though he's 78 and has no symptoms? Well, it, it's possible for everyone. I mean, it's, it's one of these diseases that, you know, some people say that if you live long enough, you're going to have Alzheimer's disease eventually. 
I mean, this is this is an extreme, of course. So is it possible? Yes, it is possible that there are forms of this disease that occur very late in life. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's that's the answer. Yeah, it is possible. Yeah, but being at seventy-eight years of age and not having any symptoms or not having any indication of uh, Alzheimer's or any kind of dementia, that's very good, and uh, it, it really means that there is also a very good possibility of living the rest of one's life without any any neurodegenerative disease associated. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Um, another member is asking about those very popular DNA genetic testing kits like 23andMe and Ant Ancestry DNA. Um, do those help scientists assist with research? Um, the tremendous amounts of data that those tests provide, how, how does that factor into research from your perspective? That's a great question. Um, so, for example, 23andMe um, has a research um, component. And so when you get one of these kits, you're, well, you're asked if you want to contribute to research going forward. And so for Parkinson's disease, for example, 23andMe has um, a whole research program devoted to it. And they make the data that they collect available to other scientists that show that they have a proper project to, to, to study that data. And so it does certainly help. Um, um, the science, the scientific community. And if you look at the most recent large genetic studies in Parkinson's disease, 23andMe has been one of these partners um, that we've had. And so it is, it, it's been, it's been great for everyone. Good. Fantastic. Um, Lynn, a question came in for you, um, you know, because of lectures like this, and we've seen Consumers Credit Union active in the community, um, why is that important for you and for members to be active in the West Michigan and the, the greater Michigan community? Oh, thank you, Steve. And thank you for asking. Uh, you know, our members are, are us. Uh, we have a culture that is steep in volunteering. Uh, we call it feet on the ground. Uh, we've been with uh, Van Andel Institute and the Purple community. Um, we did do the Purple Race in the Grand Rapids market uh, every year and have uh, been a partner for six. Um, but it's deeper than that. We feel very strongly that our own employees, our only our team, they put their feet in where their heart is. And so um, we have our leaderships, our champions that, uh, that focus on the nonprofit organizations that are doing tremendous work in all of our communities across Michigan. Uh, but I'll tell you what, uh, the reason that we do that is because of people like you. We, we, are, we get to talk with you, although virtually today, um, but we also then get to have these wonderful um, experiences with our scientists that, you know, who gets that? So we're very, very blessed in that regard. And, and our hope is that we continue longstanding partnerships that make a huge difference and an impact in our community. Because as, uh, as our doctors just mentioned, Every single one of us probably is touched uh, in some way by uh, diseases that are either genetic or that are diseases that are affecting our families. And that in the long run becomes wellness and financial wellness leads to helping us succeed. So we're very honored to be a part. Thanks, Steve. Sounds good, Lynn. Thank you so much. Uh, a few more questions that have come in. This is fantastic. Um, a specific question, um, does multiple sclerosis, does that attribute to developing Alzheimer's or Parkinson's? So there uh, are no direct links uh, between multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Um, we do see some links between, for example, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and dementia with Lewy bodies. There are genes in common, there are pathways in common. Um, multiple sclerosis is seen more like uh, an immunological disease. Um, and and it, it's typically not, not considered to have a, a direct link to, to these neurodegenerative diseases. Okay. Having said that, of course, yeah. I mean, as we continue to study, we continue to finding things that we didn't know were there. Um, and so it's possible that we will find some things in the future that link diseases together. Um, but as Rita said, as, as far as we know now, um, they're, they're separate diseases, yeah. Yeah, but it's also possible for one person to have both diseases, multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's, for example. That's that's a possibility. Yeah. Independently, yeah. Certainly, thank you. Um, question from another member who, sadly, a first cousin passed away with um, Parkinson's. Older siblings have had Parkinson's. And she's wondering, is Parkinson's disease hereditary? 
So much like uh, Alzheimer's disease, there is a small proportion of Parkinson's disease that it is in fact hereditary. I mean, it runs in families and we've found a number of genes that, um, where, that where we can test it and we can show that it is uh, present in families that way. So there's a small proportion of cases where that is true. And for those, there are genetic tests that you, know, you, can, you can get a neurologist to, to prescribe for you to, to know if your family um, and your family members are um, at higher risk of, of getting disease. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll caution that this is a, a small proportion of all Parkinson's disease cases. Fantastic, thank you. Um, how about the number of surgical procedures? A member is asking about multiple surgical surgical procedures where they've had lengthy anesthesia involved. Would this have any influence on the frequency of Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, there have been a few uh, studies linking uh, cognitive impairment with the number of anesthesias. Um, I think it's also connected with how the person, the individual reacts to, to the anesthesia. Um, but there are no definite conclusions from, from these studies. Um, so it, it is possible that there is some, some association, but there is nothing definitive at, at, at the moment. Perfect. A um, few more questions coming in. They keep flowing. This is great. Um, what factors have you considered that lead to the projection of the rise in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's in the future? Well, there's a, a clear factor, which is we're all living longer. And as we live, age is the, the highest risk factor for these diseases. We still don't really understand why, but that's a fact. And so if we're all living longer, I mean, it's just, it's going to increase in, 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 in numbers. Um, and so that's, that's you know, why it's so important that we really work on this as, as quickly as we can to, to prevent these diseases being a, a burden to the society that we cannot manage anymore. And it's the, we can see that happening, as Rita mentioned in, in the slides. It's not that far off where this is going to be such, in, is going to have such a high impact on society that, you know, we won't be able to deal with it. And that's a terrible thing to think about. Okay, question um, has come in. What testing should someone request if they have had concerns about dementia? What's, what should somebody do if they have those concerns? So uh, typically what happens is uh, you would go to your family doctor um, and uh, that doctor will um, pass you on to a neurologist um, and the neurologist would be able to perform a diagnosis to, to establish a diagnosis of, of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or uh, other types of dementia. So usually it's just a referral to, to a neurologist. Okay. Looks like we have three more questions. Um, two are referring to Lewy body dementia. Um, what, if one of you could please comment on the use of uh, DATSCAN to help towards the diagnosis of Lewy body, body dementia, the members wondering why many might discard this as a diagnostic tool. So this comes back to the fact of um, similarities between diseases. That scan is, is a, a very powerful approach to use in Parkinson's disease. People have found, I'm not a, I, I don't do imaging, so it's not my specific area, but people have found that for uh, dementia, we was in only body dementia, it isn't as accurate as it is for Parkinson's disease. And so that's one of the reasons why, um, one of the main reasons why it's not as, in, it's used is not as encouraged as it is for, for Parkinson's. Yeah. For example, if you have a negative that scan, it doesn't mean that you, you won't have a diagnosis of, of BLB. Um, so there are several factors there. Okay. Um, a question about Lewy body dementia. Um, sadly, a member's wife passed away five months ago with Lewy body dementia and is wondering if there are any organizations out there that might want to speak to the member about his observations um, about his spouse with Lewy body dementia and how that progressed over time, if there's any resources out there. Yeah, so one of one of the great resources we have here in the States is the Lewy body dementia association. Um, their website, I, I'm not affiliated with them at all, but I know their website, so I'm gonna just put it out there, is lbda.org. And that's exactly what they do. Their um, patient empowerment, patient information, um, this is what, and they're very good at doing this. They um, come up with meetings for caregivers, meetings for uh, for patients, um, 
you know, usually physical uh, encounters with, with people. Now that's not possible, but this is a great resource for information, the LBDA. Um, great. You know, Couple, two more questions. Um, somebody, you mentioned the Mind Biobank earlier, um, and a member is wondering, is there a cost to participate? And how would one participate in the Mind Biobank if they want to be involved in this project? So the way we're setting it up is there would not be a cost. I mean, that, that would make no sense. Um, one would participate. I mean, you can see how we're scientists. I just <laughs> yes. said that, you know, making money isn't, anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So the, the way that this that we're envisioning this would work is someone goes to their neurologist, and there's a diagnosis of one of these diseases and people are offered um, the possibility of joining research. And if they agree to it, a, a sample is taken right there and then, and then it's transported to the Van Andel Institute. And you know the, the genetic tests are then done um, at VAI. But the way that we're planning is this to be as um, low friction for patients as possible, because otherwise there is no point. Perfect, thank you. Two more questions. Um, again, thank you for all these amazing questions. Um, Rita and Jose, any agencies in Kent County or in West Michigan that you're aware of that would provide family support for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease would provide support to the individuals and their families? I know there's like the Alzheimer's associations and, and the Parkinson's support groups, but any others that you can think of that come to mind? I don't think so. Um, we may not know them uh, yet because we, we haven't arrived that, that long. Um, but uh, I would say the Alzheimer's Association charters, I believe, in Ann Arbor and uh, also Parkinson, the Parkinson's disease uh, support groups are, are the most important ones. Um, for Parkinson's disease, the grand challenges uh, meeting that we have at Vernando uh, every year is happening in the next week, week or mm -hmm. the, the next week. Um, so that's uh, a meeting that also has a uh, part um, dedicated and made specifically for patients and their families. Um, and they can join freely. So um, this year they can join via Zoom. Uh, so I think that's also a very, very good resource for people to talk with, with other people that have uh, a similar, similar experiences. Uh, so that may be something that, that they want to, to try and, and experience. And more information on Grand Challenges, certainly go to, yeah. to, the, to the VAI's website. Everything is there. Um, okay. If you're interested in Parkinson's disease, certainly this, this is a great meeting. It's, it's been happening uh, for many years right here in Grand Rapids, and it's, it's always attracts a large number of people. And Lynn, maybe that's a link we can send to you to send out to the membership who might be interested in attending that. Absolutely. We also um, just finished a podcast with an organization called Elder Care. Um, it is it, it is a no cost organization that that helps uh, in the caregiving arena to really get dig into what's going on in, in the family, um, and and has been just a wonderful business partner of ours. So I'll I'll put that link in too. So thank you. Great, fantastic. Um, two more questions. They keep coming. We have about two more minutes left on the questions. Um, any short-term memory problems? If, if uh, a member or somebody has short-term memory problems, does that indicate possible dementia? Not necessarily. You know, everyone um, independently of their age, they forget where they left their, their keys. Um, yep. They forget to close the door. Um, they forget where they left their car. It happens <laughs> more frequently than yep. to some than others. Uh, so it does not necessarily mean that uh, that person will develop. Uh, Alzheimer's or any kind of dementia. Um, it is a very common uh, thing to happen, um, but it may, of course, also be uh, an initial symptom of, of these diseases. Um, but without uh, consulting a neurologist and having a diagnosis and, and the proper testing, it's, it, it is common, so nothing to worry about. But it's great that people, you know, that we all now have this attention. I mean, yes. this is a positive thing. We're thinking about these, these questions, and, you know, years ago, if you had Alzheimer's in your family, that was kind of a taboo uh, topic. You wouldn't talk about it. And this is just, it's not the way to do things. I mean, there's no shame in having, you know, it's a disease. There's no shame in having one of these diseases. We, we should be mindful of, of these diseases and, and their symptoms. We should certainly talk with our doctors when there's a concern. Good, thank you. And the last question, um, are there any medications out there that deal directly with Parkinson's disease related hallucinations? 
There are, this isn't really our topic, so we won't yep. go too much in, into this. There are, um, there are some that have some side effects. And so it's all the, the suggestion is always to go to your clinician um, to talk with them about about those things. These aren't we don't know as much as as we want about these diseases, and so um, it's it's difficult to to just answer that yeah. question in 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 a void like this. So always go to your clinician. Always always discuss this with your with your physician. I can add that I was uh, I was uh, doing one of these presentations yesterday for the Movement Disorders Society meeting yesterday. This is a big international meeting. And in my session, there was uh, there was this was one of the topics. So if you want to check it out online, uh, it's MDS, um, and and the meeting is free, so you can you can access the different sessions, and and you will find uh, information about medication and hallucinations, and and that's also um, it's also a possibility. Sounds good. Um, well, that wraps up our Q&A session. Thank you to the membership for some outstanding questions. I think we had about 15 to 20 that came through. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. I'd like to thank once again, Dr. Bross and Dr. Guerrero and DeLynn and Consumers Credit Union for its generous support. Um, our work at Van Andel Institute um, continues to provide hope for those affected by Parkinson's disease, cancer, and other diseases, Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia. Please stay engaged with Van Andel Institute. We would love that. Visit our website at vai.org. Um, Lynn and the consumers team will be sending out some information about the grand challenges, which Rita and Jose mentioned. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, but whether virtually or in person, we would love to see you again at some point in the future. And I wanna turn it over to Lynn right now just to uh, wrap things up for the day. Thank you so much. You know. Um... It is such an honor to be able to chat with you today and to listen to the amazing scientists at Van Andel Institute. My mom passed away from Alzheimer's uh, just a few years ago. And as all of you with the questions that you asked, the caregiving that it takes um, is not an easy task, but it is one that, that I know that you are honored to take part in if you are. Um, most of all, though, as a member, thank you so much for being a part of what we believe are going to be tremendous amounts of, of just great uh, webinars with Van Andel Institute. So thank you so much. Number one, thank you for us. Uh, you're amazing. Hey, is the puppy around? Is the puppy around? <laughs> Dr. Thank Jose Braz, Dr. Rita Guerrero, if the We've puppies been waiting around, for that. Yeah. let's wave at the puppy. <laughs> but seriously, all of you, thank you so much for being with us today. We will be sending out a multiple, now it sounds like, links so that you have a lot of different information coming your way. Consumers Credit Union, thanks. Uh, Van Anel Institute, too. And uh, oh my goodness, the puppy is here. <laughs> okay, doesn't that just make your day? <laughs> And thank you again for all of your questions. Have a wonderful afternoon.